dear lord my father in heaven thank you lord for this beautiful day as we gather as we brothers and sisters gather to hear your word to hear all the gifts the holy spirit is uh, can give to us uh, we look forward to this word all the gifts that we can receive and uh, inherit them lord i ask all these things in your precious son jesus amen 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 thank you sister meena praise god thank you jesus so my sister and brothers welcome once again to our thursday bible class isn't that wonderful thursday bible class and we are actually on a very long journey in fact this is one topic that many of you must be saying when is this topic going to end when are we going to you know uh, have i can see melanie here by my side she's nodding her head and she's saying it's time for us to finish on eternal life but you know my brothers and sisters once when the lord gives us a topic it doesn't depend on when i want to stop it or it doesn't depend on when you know i make a decision or when you know somebody says to me stop the topic it's when the holy spirit says take a break on this let's start something else i am just going to be led by the spirit and i don't know i was thinking yesterday we would probably have the last class and i do believe that today could be or tomorrow as the spirit leads so when he's given us a topic he wants us all to you know partake understand digest it apply it and start living eternal life that's exactly what the holy spirit wants us to live so so remember my sister and brothers if the holy spirit is the captain of our life he is leading our life he is inspiring our life he is directing our life he is like the director then let him direct it as he wants it without our interference we simply obey we simply comply in fact i will tell you honestly yesterday i really was thinking that probably we would end this class on eternal life for for you know 32 or 33 classes but here we are again and i don't even know whether it's going to be the last class today but i believe that as the spirit leads we will continue this journey or end this for a, for, for some time before we you know have to go ahead maybe part 2 of eternal life i don't know i just let the holy spirit lead us but it has been an awesome journey i'm sure you all will agree i know yesterday my brothers and sisters we were studying on uh, hebrews chapter 6 and we took these verses 4 and 5 together can we put that those verses again please you know in hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 if you put those verses out there uh, hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 we studied five things that a person will have to do before they can lose their salvation and be eternally damned let me say this again there are five things that hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 list down which a person must do or must go through before a person can lose their salvation and be eternally damned so what are these five things let's quickly go through this before we go ahead they have you know they they have to have been, they should have been enlightened that's what it says in verse number 4 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened that means they they would have been enlightened they would have been enlightened by the holy spirit then they would have tasted the gift the, uh, the heavenly gift that's what he said tasted of the heavenly gift again we know i'm not going to go and teach again on that i'm sure you all would have gone and studied all that this is all what the holy spirit has been teaching us then they would have been they would have been made partakers of the holy ghost that's what we see in verses 4 so, uh, verse 4 so all these three things are given to us in verse number 4 then we go to verse number 5 it says if they if they they shall follow it uh, uh, no they have they would have tasted the good word of god that means they have tasted the good word of the lord they just not tasting the word but they would have received those revelations they would have received the secrets and then would they have received it when they sat down directed by the holy spirit so if they have never received the holy spirit they have never been born again then there will be no desire for the word of god there will be no desire to sit with the word of god there will be no desire to sit one to one with the word of god so those people who are, have not done that they still have hope but if you have been sitting with the word of god the lord has been talking to you you have been having intimacy with the lord now you are already having the holy spirit in you which means you are already 
saved, then you have tasted that revelation. You have received all those secrets from heaven by the Holy Spirit. And finally, the powers of the world to come. What are the powers of the world to come? This is talking about the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this is the supernatural power of God, which is given to us by the gifts and by the Holy Spirit. Again, I, I, I was mentioning to you very briefly, we read about this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe from verses uh, 3 to verse number 11. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this is speaking of those who have operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and have seen the power of God manifest through them. Remember, the gifts have been given not for us, but they have been given to work through us by the Holy Spirit in us. The gifts have been given for us to manifest the power of God. So my brothers and sisters, again, as I said to you, we saw these five qualifications and these five qualifications are basically describing mature Christians. This is not describing any, anybody who's, you know, who's not a Christian, who's not a believer. This is only talking about you know, mature Christians, those who have really been born again, those who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if they have been mature Christians, they have been saved, they have been born again, they have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then it describes mature Christians. And you know, here the writer of Hebrews is exhorting the readers to become exactly what they are. In, in I believe it is, is, is given is given that in Hebrews chapter 5. Let me go to Hebrews chapter 5. Again, you know, you need to study the book of Hebrews. It's a fantastic book, but I want to go just a chapter before Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter uh, 5 verses 11 and 13. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 11 and 13. He's talking to all mature Christians and he's telling these mature Christians that this is exactly how you are supposed to behave when you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have been born again and now you are going to be held accountable. And if you are not operating that way, then you are basically going to go against the Lord and you are not going to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Let's read that. Verses 11 to 13. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. Look at this verse number 13. It says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. What is the meaning of this? You have been given right now the new birth. You have now received Christ inside of you. You have now received the Holy Ghost. And now that you have received the Holy Ghost, you have been born again. You are not being directed by the Holy Ghost. You're, you're disobeying the Holy Ghost. You're not spending time with the word. And therefore, you are still a baby. You are still a baby. But the moment you're born again, you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's time for you to move on from just drinking milk to get to solid food. That's what he's talking about. You need to eat solid food. You need to eat meat. You need to grow. And if you're not growing and you're still a little baby, a baby that is not going to grow is eventually going to go and become a reprobate because that baby is not interested, is not, he's going to disobey the Holy Spirit. So we are going to be held accountable. So having said this, my brothers and sisters, the author of Hebrews was saying that immature Christians cannot reject their salvation. That's, let me say this again. The writer of Hebrews is saying only mature Christians can reject their salvation, but immature Christians, what is the meaning of immature Christians? You know, there are people who are born again, but they have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There were people, many in the, in the New Testament, like Apollos, they were born again, but they had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as a result, they wanted to preach the word of God. And when they went to preach the word of God, when they opened their mouth, it was, it, they, they were not speaking the truth. 
It was not being directed by the Holy Spirit. They were trying to speak with their brains. They were trying to speak with their own knowledge. It was not coming from the Holy Spirit. It was only coming through, you know, some references and some books and some somebody's notes and all these other things. But when the Holy Spirit is going to direct you, the Holy Spirit inside of you is going to teach you. And when you open your mouth and start speaking, it is the Holy Spirit in you who's talking through you and is letting, giving the people that information, that knowledge, that secret, the truths. So remember, only immature, the mature Christians can reject their salvation, not the immature Christians. Because the moment you receive the Holy Spirit, the moment your life is directed by the Holy Spirit, and you are not being directed by the Holy Spirit, in spite of the Holy Spirit directing your life, you are disobeying, you are going to eventually uh, grieve the Holy Spirit, and you're going to become a reprobate and you're going to lose your salvation. You know, my brothers and sisters, let me give you an example. You know, sometimes people, when you explain like this, people sometimes don't understand. And then they begin to say, what is the meaning of this? Am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to go to hell? Listen to this. Let me give you an example. You know, my brothers and sisters, we all have been teenagers. We all have grown up, you know, from, from, you know, young children, we have grown up and become teenagers. I remember when I was a teenager, I was a very rebellious teenager. You know, for me to listen to elders was not easy. I, I always used to, you know, argue. I always had wanted to have, I had a mind of my own. So I'm going to tell you with respect to that, to that example, so that you will begin to understand what I'm really saying here. You know, it's, yeah, for example, if there is, a, there are some teenagers who are below their age, you know, who have been called, you know, an adult who want to now renounce their families. You know, say for example, a teenager, he wants to grow, he wants to become an adult before time. He doesn't want to, you know, be with his family. He just wants to leave the house. He wants to have his own freedom. Now, when they are children, they would not have such a desire. They would not have such a desire in them to do this and to get out of the house. And many children, my brothers and sisters, have been upset and said, that, you know, I wish I was not born to these parents. I wish I was not belonging to this family. I wish I belonged to that family on the other side. And they would have, you know, desired to be the children of somebody else's parents. But, you know, my sister and brother, just because they had this desire, because they did not have very loving parents, or because, you know, they, they, they did not have the freedom that their, that their peers or their colleagues had, you know, the law would not allow them to, you know, do as they wished. Why? Because they are not old enough to know what they are really trying to do or what they are really saying. But once they have grown up and they want to change, you know, their names or they want to separate from their families, the law would back them up. It all depends on their level of maturity. So remember, once the, the you know, when, when, a, when a teenager grows up and they want to leave their family and they want to live independently, the parents cannot hold them back. They will just leave the house and they'll go. And so many countries, you know, abroad in the, in the West, by the time they're 18, they simply leave their families and go. And the law cannot stop those children from living with their families. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, these verses that we have read in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, they are saying that immature Christians will not be held accountable for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or against God. Why? Because they don't know what they are saying. They don't even know have the Holy Spirit in them. They, they have not received the baptism. Maybe some of them are not even born again. So those people will not be held accountable if they say something against God. So sometimes many people say something just, you know, out of, out of hand and they think that they have blasphemed against in the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example of Paul himself. You know, Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. He was Saul. And, you know, he blasphemed God. He did all sorts of nasty things. He was killing Christians. You know, Paul himself, I won't say Paul, now he was Paul. Paul himself said, can you put that verse, please? It is, I think, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 or 13. Can you put that verse, please? You know, Paul himself said he was forgiven of his blasphemy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. I think it is verse number 13. Look at verse number 13. Let's read that. He was that. before a blasphemer. And a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So when Saint Paul did all these things of blaspheming God, he was persecuting Christians, he was injuring Christians, he did it all these things, he did it 
when he was a Pharisee. He did it before he was born again. He did it before he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So whatever he did before he received Christ and before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says, I received mercy from God because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But you know, my brothers and sisters, if you and I are going to say that we are still in unbelief, that, you know, we still don't are not born again, that we still don't have the Holy Spirit, then what are we doing all this time? There is no time left. We are already on this planet at how many years of our life? You know, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He has given us the Holy Spirit. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And what are we doing? We should be immediately born again. We should receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we should live our life as disciples of Jesus. We should live our life as really followers and true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So St. Paul would say these things. Because at that time when he was doing all this thing of blaspheming, persecuting, killing Christians, he had still not been born again and he had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, you know, doesn't let us, you know, you know, immature Christians who get discouraged many a times and, you know, say some foolish things and they, they will not become reprobate because they rejected God. Let me say this again. You know, People who are immature, people who have never been born again, people who have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when they get discouraged and, you know, they say foolish things, I don't want God, I, I, I am God, you know, God, I got something, they say nasty things. They will, not be, they will not be considered as reprobates because they rejected God because they don't even have the Holy Spirit. And they're just talking, you know, anything out of it because they've never been saved. But I don't think that if you have been listening to God's word, you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, that you and I can be, you know, allowed to say these things because the Holy Spirit in us will only call Jesus Christ as Lord. We saw, we saw that yesterday. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord unless he is directed by the Holy Spirit. So remember, my brothers and sisters, if, they were, if these people were not, they were not mature as defined in these verses, they will not be held accountable for their actions. There is still hope for them. There is still hope for them to be saved. Because remember, there are so many people in the world today who don't know Christ. They are not born again. They have never received the Holy Spirit. So there is no hope for them. But what about the people who have already received the word of God? They have received the knowledge of the word of God. They have been hearing the teaching on the word of God. Now, for example, in this Bible class, we've been having this Zoom class for the last two years. There is so much of wealth of information on the YouTube. Two years we've been having this Bible class. Some of you probably are hearing the word of God all your life. Many of you have been hearing two years, three years, five years. You've been part of some ministry. You've been part of some community. You've been part of some particular church. You have been hearing the word of God. After hearing the word of God, do you think that we will not be held accountable for what we heard? We are going to be held accountable. But what are we doing with this word that we have heard? What are we doing with all the secrets and all this revelation that we are receiving? Is it only for us to keep in some notebook and put it into our library? Or is it somewhere to keep in some notebook somewhere and just leave it there? It is supposed to be planted in our hearts. We are supposed to put it into practice. We are supposed to bear the fruit of the kingdom. And therefore, brothers and sisters, there is more hope for people on the streets who have not received the good news those who are still have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and then receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then for people who have received it all and are simply keeping the talent buried in the ground and they will be held accountable because they are wasting their time, they are wasting all these secrets, they are wasting all this talent, they are wasting all this wealth that is on the inside and that is the Holy Spirit. And the time comes with all these things given to us, we don't start using it the Holy Spirit stops talking to us. We grieve the Holy Spirit. And now we become reprobate. We are not going to be hurt. We are just going to do religion. We are just going to go through the motions of life. And there is no more hope for such people. But praise God, if today we repent, we say, Holy Spirit, all this time, I did not realize that I was, you know, not aware of what I was supposed to do. I was not aware of, you know, what you were calling me to do. I was just taking life for granted. I was focused on so many other things. But now I repent and I come back. I want to start living for you. I want to start living for my God. I want to start bearing the fruit of the kingdom. And that's exactly where the Lord is going to take us. So remember, my brothers and sisters, this is not going to be for everybody. Again, when we go to verse number six, I'm going to speak more about it. So let's today go to Hebrews chapter six. 
verse number six. Hebrew chapter six, verse number six. That's a concluding verse on on the uh, on Hebrews chapter six. We started verses four and five yesterday. So today, let's go to verse number six. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Look at this verse again very carefully, my brothers and sisters. This is talking about those people who after receiving all those five things we studied in verses four and five, if they have gone through that and now they reject Christ, it is difficult to renew them again to repentance because they crucified the Son of God again and put him to open shame. Do you think that anybody can crucify Christ again? But after receiving Christ, after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you ignore what the Lord has done for you. You ignore that gift that is given to you. It is as good as putting Jesus on that cross and making him suffer the agony of the cross all over again. You know, my brothers and sisters, spiritually, if you begin to do these things by ignoring Christ, what has been given to you, now you can never be saved again if you have ignored Christ. This is very serious. I hope you understand. You know, we are all called to live eternal life. And therefore, the Lord first and foremost gives us this new birth uh, to um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We become a new creation. And then through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit. But now, after receiving all this, we go away and, you know, we don't value what we have already received. It is as good as putting Jesus on the cross and making him go through that whole suffering all over again. You know, my brothers and sisters, this verse, now look at this verse again. I want you all to focus and please pay attention. This verse can set many of us free today. This verse can truly change our life today. It is decision time, but if you must understand this, you know, this verse is not talking of someone sinning or failing God in some area. This is not talking about that. It's not talking about, you know, that you will, you will commit some sin in some place after being born again, after receiving the Holy Spirit, or you have failed God in a particular area of your life. No, 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 it's not talking about that. This is speaking of becoming an apostate. An apostate means somebody who has, after receiving all this, you have openly gone and rejected Christ. You have been screaming. You know, these people who they call atheists, they go there and they, they say that oh, they're so proud. There is no God, they say. You know, my brothers and sisters, I want to, I want to, I, I really went and did some research there. You know that that the Greek word paripipto, paripipto, parapipto, that's exactly what it says. It was described, this word says fall away. Parapipto. That's a Greek word, parapipto. And that parapipto was translated fall away. That's what it says. If they shall fall away, if they shall parapipto. So remember, my brothers and sisters, parapipto is nothing but fall away. The same thing is described in Hebrew chapter 10, verse number 29. That's why I want to go there. I want to go to this verse because it's going to complement Hebrew chapter 6, verse number 6. So let's go to Hebrew chapter 10, verse number 29. And when we go to verse number 29, we will begin to understand parapito. We'll begin to understand what is being falling away. We'll begin to understand much better exactly the process and we should now never get to this particular stage. Let's read that. Verse number 10, 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace there is so much in this verse, my brothers. I, I really hope that I can finish telling, explaining this whole verse today. But look at this verse again. Verse number 29. Of how much sore punishment, how harsh the punishment, how much sore the punishment. Suppose you shall be worthy, thought worthy, who has trodden down, who has gone walking, who has disrespected, underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of Jesus. 
wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and is done despite unto the spirit of grace. You know, when a person receives the Holy Spirit, who's going to control your life? The Holy Spirit is going to tell you, listen, Jesus paid it all for you on the cross. He died for you. He shed his blood. He died for you personally. And after this revelation has been given to you, my brothers and sisters, you know, how could anybody ever, you know, it's something like this. I don't know whether I, I've given you an example. Say, for example, you know, you, were, you went on the high right, on, a, on the top of your building. And all of a sudden, you were doing some gardening. or you, And all of a sudden, you, were, you, were, you lost your balance and you are just holding one hand. You're clinging for your life. And if you leave that hand, you're going to go at least 10, 20 floors down. You're going to fall, have a free fall. And you're going to be completely destroyed. At that very moment, somebody walks up on top of the building by chance. And that person gives you the other hand. He pulls you out and he brings you to safety. You would have been dead if that person, because you would have not had the strength to hold on for so long, you would have died that day. But that man came. Now your response to this man will be simply incredible because that person saved your life. That person came in the way at the right time and pulled you out from losing your life. Now imagine all of us, every single person was going to hell. But Jesus came to the earth he took you by the hand and he says, you know, because of your sin, you're going to hell. And he says, I took your place on the cross. I died in your place. I washed you in my blood. Now I have opened heaven for you. Now after he has done all this, now that you know what he has done for you, still you treat the blood of Jesus. You treat, you treat the Holy Spirit like a cheap commodity. You still want to go by your stubborn ways. You want to do things your own way. And you think you will still make it to heaven. You are living in a fool's paradise, my brothers and sisters, and you don't understand the significance of the blood of Jesus. That's exactly what verse number 29 is saying. After you have received all this, after you have got all this revelation, after you have realized what was the cost that was paid for you, everything has been explained to you, you are still taking for granted the blood of Jesus. Do you think that you will ever have any opportunity again after you have disobeyed the Holy Spirit? You know, sisters and brothers, these verses are not referring to Christians who sin, but are repentant later, as long as, you know, they, they want to do better later. Let me say this again. You know, supposing you are, say, for example, you are a Christian. You have done some particular wrong. You have done something wrong in your life. You have had a very bad life all your life. And now you came to the word. Now you understood the word. You understood the cost that was paid. Now you repent of all that and you want to do better now. You want to change your ways. You want to give your life to Jesus. This is not talking about you. This is not saying that you will become a reprobate. This verse is speaking of people who have totally renounced their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they hate God. They dislike God. They hate God's name. They don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to come to God. They don't want to do anything with God. These are the people who are God haters. These are the people who have actually after tasting the goodness of the Lord, have gone. You know, there are so many people today, I'll tell you my brothers and sisters, who have actually experienced the goodness of the Lord. And all of a sudden, there has been some bad news in their family. Some loved one died. Somebody, you know, they lost their job, they lost their money, they lost their finances. And because of that one incident, because they believe that the Lord took them away, they are so bitter with God. They don't want to do anything with church. They don't want anything to do with God. Now, listen, before this incident happened, they received the knowledge. They know what God did for them. They understood what the price of, uh, was paid for them on the cross. But because of that one incident, they start blaming God and they become God haters. In such a situation, my brothers and sisters, only the love of God can set them free. But people who have experienced the love of God and have then gone away, these are the people who have now become reprobate. You know, this is speaking, my brothers and sisters, of people who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. Look at this verse again. I want you to highlight this, please. Just highlight this. Who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. I don't know, my brothers and sisters, right now as I'm sharing this with you, I begin to feel such pain to understand that there are people who can trod underfoot the Son of God. They can trod underfoot the blood of Jesus. I mean, think about it, my brothers and sisters. There is an eternity out there. There is a heaven out there that God has created for us. There are going to be streets of gold. There are going to be mansions for us. 
There is going to be all the good things that you will never experience in this life. God has prepared for us. And he's telling us, whatever little you're going through, these are only light afflictions. These are only light afflictions. St. Paul had to go through the, to the, to the, you know, to the beatings about five, six times, the 39 lashes. He was shipwrecked. And yet he's saying light afflictions because he's looking at everything with respect to eternity. You know, for example, if you, do, if you have a bad marriage, Many of you people say, Lord, you have forgotten about me. But think about it with respect to eternity. In heaven, there are no marriages. I don't have to deal with this marriage anymore. In, when you put this whole thing in perspective, you are simply grateful to the Lord. You are simply thankful to the Lord. Maybe you don't have money, you know, sometimes to eat your breakfast or a, or a dinner. You're just living. Praise God, there is a time coming when, you know, there'll be a buffet laid for you in heaven. So everything you begin to look with respect to what Jesus has done. But praise God, if you go to his word, he will supply all your need. So if you look at everything with respect to what Jesus has done, with respect to eternity, your whole perspective changes and you're always grateful to the Lord. You're grateful for the blood of Jesus. You're grateful for the little things. You are stop complaining and murmuring. You stop this business of all the time, you know, opening your mouth and, and, and speaking rubbish out of your mouth. You begin to always become grateful because you have understood what the Lord has done. And when you begin to understand, you are giving the value to that blood of Jesus. You're giving value to that sacrifice of Jesus. You're not, you know, walking underfoot to the blood of Jesus by complaining and murmuring and, you know, disrespecting the blood of Jesus. You know, sisters and brothers, again, as I said, these verses are not referring to Christians who sin, but repent later as long as, you know, they want to become better. This is speaking of people who have totally renounced their faith in the Lord and they hate God with all their heart. You know, again, as I said, you, you know, we cannot, uh, you know, trot down the, 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 son, the underfoot, the son of God. This again, my brothers and sisters, is not, you know, speaking of Christians, you know, making mistakes or even openly sinning because of the weakness of their flesh. You know, many times because of the weakness of our flesh, you know, we could commit sin. We could openly commit sin. This is this actually this this particular verse about people who become retrograde is talking about people who sin because they hate God and want to grieve the Son of God and frustrate what He did for them as much as possible. I don't think anybody among us here in this class or anybody for that matter, you know, who's listening would ever have reached that stage. We are not reaching that stage. The reason I'm trying to explain these scriptures is just to tell you how grateful we need to be to the Lord. We are not talking about these scriptures today because we are going to go away from the Lord. I don't think anybody in this class ever wants to go and become a reprobate. Anyone wants to openly abuse the Lord. Anyone wants to, you know, hate God. We all love the Lord. That's why we are coming to Bible class. But I'm explaining the scriptures so that we begin to appreciate. We begin to value. We begin to put, you know, so much of gratefulness to what Jesus has done. And we begin to start living a quality life for the Lord. We start living an eternal life with the Lord. You know, my brothers, look at this verse again in, um, in Hebrew chapter 29. And as, and as counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified. You know, I want you to look at these words. Has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified. You know, these words counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith the person was sanctified. An unholy thing is speaking about a person who at one time was a partaker of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Yet, this person totally turned away from God, rejected faith in the Son of God, rejected faith in the Savior, and counted the shed blood of Jesus as some cheap commodity, as some common thing. And, you know, he has gone something and, and totally gone and, and he just considers the blood of Jesus no better than, you know, or, or as compared to anybody's blood. You know, you cannot take for granted the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is pure. The blood of Jesus is pure. It's, it, it is the best blood that was shed for the holy blood that was shed. And therefore, my brothers and sisters, we cannot take the, the, the blood of God for granted. Look at this again, further what it says. An unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. And has done so despite. What is the meaning of this? The word despite, it, what does it signify? It signifies utter 
and and i would say you know total contempt for the spirit of grace it it it, it indicates like you know you consider the spirit of god as some cheap commodity just you know take for granted whatever it is you know my brothers is the word literally if you correctly go the word literally means an intentional i would say insult or it is it is an intended you are you are deliberate in your insult to the to the lord i don't think any one of us would ever go and do that you know it is describing someone who willfully wants to harm the lord and everything that the lord stands for you know today there are people who who glorify homosexuality they glorify same sex marriage and you know when they go and look at these parades they are actually going there on the streets and watching these people do all that you should not even be standing in front of those things to see what those people are doing the other glorifying god marriage is between man and woman marriage is between adam and, and eve not between adam and steve yet people when they live the same sex marriage they are all standing there taking pictures and they want to see all this around you are glorifying those people we should not even be we should be speaking against those things because those people are actually insulting god they are insulting the very thing that god has put into their life you know my brothers sisters let me let me tell you something all of the description in this verse that is verse number 29 are signifying a person who is an apostate not a true believer and follower of the lord who sins all the time you know if you really begin to understand that now that we have the lord now that we have the holy spirit we are accountable to him we can't take for granted we love the lord but because we love the lord we are going to be held accountable for what he has given us imagine you go to the office they give you a job they give you a position they give you a job of manager they give you a laptop they give you a seat they give you they invest in your in in in, in the office they invest in your paying you salary they want to give you a bonus they just the company is spending money for you and you come every day and you simply have coffee and go home do you think that you are doing justice to your job in the same way the lord jesus christ has shed a sent the, the heavenly father sent his son jesus into this world he invested in his blood for you and me he has he has washed you in his blood he has given you his holy spirit and are you simply going to take what has been given to you and bear no fruit you know my brothers and sisters listen to this again you know those who truly love the lord those who truly love the lord and yet sin however grievously need not fear these verses why why because these verses are only for those who totally renounce their faith in the lord they renounce their faith in the lord they know what they have done and they don't care a damn what they are doing i don't think anyone here right now ever cares a damn but even though you may not care a damn or you may not say this sort of attitude what you are doing how you are responding can actually mean that you don't care what the holy spirit has been given to you for example you go to the office and they invest in you giving you a job of a manager there are people who are waiting for you to make decisions you know they are giving you a salary but you don't care a damn you say I don't care what they are doing. I'm going to get my salary. Will they give you a salary? Aren't you going to be held accountable? You will be held accountable. So, if you really have received the Holy Spirit, you are truly saved and born again. Then it's time for you to understand who you have, and it's time for you to respond. You know, my brothers and sisters, only the people who actually know what they have received and they know that they have the Holy Spirit in them, and now they don't care. These are the people who will become reprobate. when you begin to become stubborn the lord is telling you to do something but you are taking cover in some particular law you are taking cover in some particular words of people you are taking christ to take protection based on what your parents said or your grandparents said or you are taking protection based on what your superior said now in spite of the holy spirit talking to you you prefer to take comfort in human words you will be held accountable to the lord remember there is no way out if the holy spirit is telling you something you say to all the other people i don't care what anybody says i care what the holy spirit says because i know what has been done by the lord for me i hope you understand you know people when they receive the holy spirit and when they, the lord speaks to them you cannot take these things for granted because if you take it you can actually reach a stage of becoming a reprobate you know eventually brothers and sisters you may not hate the lord you may not directly say but if the lord says if you really love me you will keep my word which means if the lord is speaking to you and you don't do what it says 
then you are beginning to hate the Lord. You may not openly say, but the very fact that you're disobeying the Lord and disobeying the Holy Spirit is means that you now begin to hate the Lord. And only for those people, there is no hope of being reconciled to the Lord once they become reprobate. You know, my brothers, this is a process. It can't happen overnight. It's not going to happen in one day. It's not going to happen in two days. It's a, it's a, it's a progressive place to go and become a reprobate. So every day when you hear the word of God, every day the spirit of God is talking to you. Every day he's expecting you to grow. We studied that. You can't just remain a baby there and say, okay, I'm listening to the word of God. I go to church. Somebody is teaching me the word of God. How long are you going to be held by the hand to cross the road? How many long are you going to be, you know, your parents are going to come. Your parents are dead and gone and still waiting for your parents to meet you to cross the road. You have already grown up. You can go on the road yourself. You'll look left. You'll look right. You'll cross the road. In the same way in the spiritual realm, when the Lord has given you his spirit, he's given you his word, he's given you all the gifts of the spirit. Whom are you waiting for? You need to start acting, my brothers and sisters. And therefore, there is no hope for people who have never heard the gospel so that they can be given the gospel, they can be baptized, and they can start. You know, sisters and brothers, you'll be surprised. You know, in North India, especially in parts of India, there are so many evangelists and so many people preaching the word of God. They are going out there and those people who have never heard the gospel, the moment they receive the good news, the moment they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, they cannot contain themselves. They are going out into villages. They are going to their families. They are being persecuted, but they want to share the good news because they want to share what they have received. And this is the sign of somebody who is truly saved. This is the sign of somebody who has understood the blood of Jesus. This is the sign of somebody who values the blood of Jesus. This is a sign of somebody who doesn't care about their life. They are dying to sell in order to give the good news to others. These are the people who truly value the blood of Jesus. Whereas those who are just sitting with the Holy Ghost, they are actually reaching a stage where they will become reprobate if they continue disobeying the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, my brothers, as I said to you, there is more hope for those people who have still not heard the good news because they can be reconciled to the Lord. They can be, but people who have received all these things, once they lose the Holy Spirit, they cannot be reconciled again. You know, we already saw this earlier in verses 4 and 5. I don't want to go back and teach on that. So this verse, that verse number 29, is clearly saying that once people willfully reject the Lord and have enough maturity, I mean, the maturity is not going to come overnight. It's a process. You're going to learn the word. The Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. You're going to sit one to one. The Lord is going to speak to you. And then you're going to go on a journey. So you're growing from maturity. From a baby, you're growing to maturity. So once you know you have received enough maturity to know what they are doing, as described in verses, uh, you know, Hebrew chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it's impossible for them to be saved again. It's impossible. There is no such thing as being born again, again. There's only one time you're born again. And once you're born again, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you're called to act. Now you're called to perform. Now you're called to go and preach the gospel. Now you're called to go and bear the fruit. And once you receive this, and you're just sitting on your backside, you're sitting on your hunches, you're sitting on the throne of your life, there is no more sacrifice for their sins anymore once they have turned away. You know, my brothers and sisters, let me say this again. Jesus dealt with their sins once and for all. He dealt with their sins once and for all. And if they reject that, he will not die for their sins again. Remember that. He will not die for our sins again. He died for our sins once and for all. And the moment you believe that sacrifice, you are born again. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have to go out and start, you know, producing the fruit of the kingdom. Instead of these verses teaching, you know, a loss of salvation every time we sin. And that we have to repent and, you know, get back into the grace of God. These verses are proclaiming just the opposite. Now I'm going to give you just the good news. They are proclaiming just the opposite. If people do, not, do renounce their salvation, they can never recover from that again. Please listen very carefully, my brothers and sisters. If people have received the Holy Ghost, they are truly born again, and now they renounce their salvation, they can never recover from that again. They can never be brought to salvation because they have willfully rejected the Lord. Now, before I conclude for today, 
I want you all to carefully listen with complete attention. If you're if you're multitasking, if you've got chicken on the oven, or you are multitasking by watching a YouTube videos, you're chatting with somebody right now. This moment, I want you to pay full attention. Listen to this, my brothers. You know, after we are born again, listen to this. After we are born again, if we could lose our salvation when we sin or be backslid and we could enter into, into a damn state until we repent and get back into salvation, which is, you know, unfortunately, the, the religious church is preaching today, then the best thing, you know, what would be happen when a person is born again? The best thing when a person is born again would be, you know, they, they, they are all born again. You preach the gospel to them. You give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit and let them go to the next room and have a firing squad and shoot all of them and kill them all. So now they can all go to heaven. Would that be the best thing to do? Would it be the best thing to kill all new converts as soon as they are saved? That would be the only way that they would ever retain their salvation. If what this verse is that, you, that the religious church has been teaching us is, 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 is exactly what it is. But that is not true, my brothers and sisters. That is a foolish doctrine. That is a stupid doctrine that every time we sin, we are going to lose our salvation. I told you, the day we are born again, the day we receive the Holy Ghost, our past, present, and future sins have been wiped out. We are now made sons and daughters of the kingdom. And now that we receive God, now that we are God conscious, now that we have got God inside of us, now we are called to go and produce the fruit of the kingdom. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, if today people have been born again, truly born again, and they've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it will show by the way they live their life. It will show by the way they conduct themselves. It will show by the way they speak. It will show by the way they, you know, prioritize their life. It will only show how much they value what they have already received. Many a times, people, they think that they have had received salvation. They think that they are born again. They think that they have the Holy Ghost. They will come to the word of God or they'll go to a particular ministry as long as, you know, they can hear some music to their ears. But when it comes to the point of decision making, it comes to accountability, they will simply walk away because it becomes a very strong soap. Let me show you my brothers and sisters. I want to end today, you know, in, 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 in John chapter 6. I'm not going to go there and preach there, but I want you to pay attention. In John chapter 6, Jesus is talking to all those disciples of his where, you know, he was, um, they were following him all throughout this ministry. And he says to them, you know, my boys, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. You know what happens? They begin to question among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can he give us his blood to drink? Does he think we are cannibals? Again, this is something for your homework. John chapter 6. And, you know, when Jesus hears them, he says, do you, do you think what I'm saying to you is, is too difficult for you to hear? What if you see the Son of Man going up to heaven? What if you see the glory of the Son of God? And he says again to them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life with you. You will never have eternal life. And all the disciples leave him and they all go away. They just leave Jesus. They leave his ministry. They leave him completely and they go back to their normal life. All that is left is 12 disciples. Then he looks to his 12 disciples and he says, do you all also want to go? The door is left open. You also can all leave. And Peter looks to Jesus and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the message. You have the words of eternal life. You have the message of eternal life. Peter spoke those words even before he was born again because he had seen Jesus perform all those signs that no human being had done. And today, my brothers and sisters, you and I who have received the new birth, we have received the Holy Spirit, we have seen the glory in our life. If we are still sitting down and we are turning the blood of Jesus as commonplace without producing any fruit, we can actually be in danger of becoming reprobate. We can become, we can be in danger of, you know, despising the blood of Jesus. This particular doctrine, this particular teaching will never be taught in the body of Christ because in the body of Christ, in the religious church, all they want you to do is come and give your attendance, put your hand in your pocket, put that money during the offertory and give your attendance to the church and go back home. You are all right. 
And when you die, they will say you will receive eternal life because they will also pray for you. Eternal rest given unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May their soul rest in peace. But I want to tell you, all that is religious teaching. When you and I receive the new birth, when you and I receive the Holy Spirit, we are going to be held accountable. God has invested the blood of his son, Jesus. He has shed his precious blood to wash you and me clean. And therefore, he expects fruit in return. He expects through that intimacy, through that relationship that you and I have through the Holy Spirit to go out and bring those people who are there because he's not going to preach the gospel. He's not going to come and go to the pulpit and preach. He needs you and me who have been washed in the blood to go and share the good news. And therefore, if you and I are simply coming to the Lord only to get our miracle, to get our house fixed, to get our grandchildren blessed, to get our children blessed, to get our bank balance fitted, to get, you know, our health good, and all that is about ourselves and me and my family, you are actually not have understood so far what really eternal life is. Because eternal life is not a life living for yourself. It's not a life for me and mine. It is a life living for the kingdom. It's a life living by dying to self so that you can go and give the same life to others by sharing with them your testimony, sharing with them the good news through the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, brothers and sisters, if you and I have truly understood that we have been saved, then God is expecting the least that we could do is go and share our testimony, go and tell others what he has done so that those people who have never heard the gospel can also come back and receive the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, my brothers and sisters, God loves everybody. He loves everybody, even the Eskimo on the North Pole, right everybody. And he doesn't want anyone to be lost. But he cannot come back and preach the gospel. He needs you and me who have received the Holy Spirit, who have been born again, so that we can step out and make a difference in our own life, in our own locality, in our own community, in our own congregation, in our own church, in our own, in our own, you know, own area, circle of influence that only you can do when you and I step out and become a blessing in the kingdom. And that's why we are blessed to be a blessing. We are not blessed to enjoy and selfishly enjoy our house and our garden and our children and our grandchildren and, you know, just spend a little bit of time doing a little bit of things. We are called to die to self so that what God has invested, he died for you and me. You and I are called to die to self so that we can go out and be a blessing and live this eternal life first, live this relationship first, and through this intimacy, go and bring souls into the kingdom. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is serious stuff. This is people who are going to walk the narrow way. This is not for people who walk the broad way. This is just not saying, you know, that, you know, I will just come and do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little song here, a little preaching there. This is a lifestyle that we are called to live. We are supposed to be tuned to the Holy Spirit 24 seven, we need the Lord every moment. He's there with us. He has promised to never leave us. But are we with him? Is he, he has already promised to be with us. But are we with him? This is a question that each one of us need to ask ourselves. Are we with the Lord? Are we tuned to him? Are we going to step out? Or are we going to be determined to do what we want to do and lose our salvation without, with no fruit to show? And there's a day of reckoning coming. So let us know that the truth has set us free. Let us go out. Let us reprioritize our life. Let us refocus ourselves. Let us set things right and keep the heavenly kingdom. Let us keep the spiritual realm. Let us keep God's kingdom number one priority. And you will see the glory every single day of your life. When we come back tomorrow, we'll go to John chapter 10 verse 30. There is still something more to learn there before we conclude. I believe the Lord still has got more to teach us on eternal life. We'll try to finish it this week, I believe. But praise God. The Lord really wants to tell us he loves us so much. He wants to give us all the revelation, even whatever we speak. He doesn't want us to speak it with our own brains and with our own intentions. Even the Lord will give us the words to speak. As long as we value his word, we value the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So let's do a concluding prayer, Sister Michelle. Praise God. Dear brother. Heavenly Father, please help me to know and understand your grace. Help me to see your grace more clearly, scriptures, and through my own experience. 
let the verses about your basic path to help me to live a supernatural life to be true in my life as I help others experience your way. Heavenly Father, you are a good and righteous God who faithfulness continues from one generation to next. Thank you for our great salvation. Thank you for the opportunity we have to work to for your praise and to love others with the love that you first gave us. May we live each day of our life as unto, unto the Lord and ask that you would give us opportunities to minister in love to the body of Christ. Thank you that nothing we do ever goes unnoticed by you. May our lives be a daily witness and a living sacrifice to your grace and goodness. I make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Michelle. Praise God. Thank you.